morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. <laughs> well, good morning and hello, who kids? You're here already. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what, I literally don't know what happened. It just did that. I know. It, it, everything's been very weird software wise this morning. I've had to read I was, YouTube a couple of times. I don't, I don't know what's going on. I was just about to start rocking out to the music. I was like, oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly, I don't know what happened. I'll, I'll figure it out later. <laughs> okay, well, let's pretend the music just finished. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three, and episode number four hundred three of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Grier Media Network. Yay! Oh, today, recording day is Thursday, June thirteenth. Uh, it's the late, unfortunately, Beaver Mama's birthday. She would have been eighty-five today. So, oh. <clears throat> happy birthday, Mama! Um, I'm your host, the eager Beaver pronouns he, him, hey, he, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. And I believe it's also Kit Hugh's birthday today as well. So oh, if you? I got that correct, happy birthday to you, Kit Hugh. I am your host, the eager Beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, eh? And with me, as always, is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. A big thank you goes to our podcast's founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Misfee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Um, we have one episode planned for you today, but we're not quite sure whether or not it's going to happen. So uh, we've started, and uh, we'll see what's going on. But before we get any further... Let's ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Well, uh, pretty good, actually. Yes. Uh, surprisingly good, uh, and I, I have no idea why. I'm feeling good about myself. I'm a little tired. I didn't sleep well, and oh, Lola's sitting right here beside me. I'll see if I can get the camera on her. She's um, being very uh, frisky this morning. <laughs> Just, oh. I, I don't know what's up with her. A frisky Lola. There she is. Here we go. I'll just put the camera on her. And I'll bring that onto the scene in a second. Here we are. <laughs> oh, who's a good girl? Who's a good girl? Oh, that's yeah. a happy pup. I don't that's know. a happy yeah. pup. Yeah, she's very, um, very content and happy this morning. Look at this. <laughs> oh, that's a happy pup. <laughs> she's adorable. All right. Uh, anything else, Mr. Grizzly? Uh, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I don't know why I'm feeling good this morning. Uh, like I said, I didn't sleep well last night. Um, Alex? I, I was up, I think at four I woke up and then I fell back to sleep. And then Lola normally comes and wakes me up at 5.30. This morning she crawled into bed on top of me at 5 a.m., which is, you know, I, I'd like that little extra bit of sleep and I yeah. didn't get it this morning. And now she's she's right at my... She's got her head on my knee. So she's just really, I, I don't know, really amorous this morning. I don't know what's in, gotten into her. Did you just say amorous? Amorous, yes. She's, oh, my God. What? <laughs> yes, you know, yes. She just wants Alice. a lot of attention this morning. I don't know what's up with her. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm feeling good. Maybe may, it might have something to do with this little mutt here that just kind of demands attention from me, and that does uh, help my mental health a great deal, not going to lie. It really does. Doggies have a way of doing that, as do kitties, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm feeling good this morning, and I, I'm surprised I feel good because, you know, tomorrow is my last day at uh, my uh, my current job. I don't know what I'm going to be doing come Monday. I might have to go back out into the field, which is not appealing to me because I just, 
I just can't do it. It's gonna it'll be like a three week thing before my vacation okay. starts. But my uh, like I've got a tendons in my left arm are shot. My shoulders, my right shoulder is done. My back is finished. My knees are shot. I'm a goaltender, right? And my left foot, I've been having a, a like a tendonitis problem in it for a while now. So how I'm going to be able to do that sort of work, I don't know. If that's what I have to do for three weeks, I don't know how I'm going to be able to get through it. So maybe I'll start an OnlyFans. <laughs> 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 my no no my my angry speedo man rants oh yes let's start that right away <laughs> all right there you go uh apparently our guest had not received the link so I'm, maybe i made a mistake when i uh put in the email address when i sent it to him but he's got it now so he should he should be joining us soon uh okay. hesitation we didn't know if our, our guest was busy uh because that happened to us uh, last evening we were going to record uh, something with uh our guest from the mental health project uh men's mental sorry the men's project uh in uh, la ronge saskatchewan and uh uh our guest is from the indigenous community and well you know uh, when an elder needs something. Yeah, no, no, you, yep. you drop. Elders come, yep, you drop and do. So uh, elders always come first, uh, even here. So uh, we had no problem with that. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, basically uh, a couple of minutes after we finished our promo, uh, he texted and then sort of like, it's like, he's here, but. <laughs> it was already in bed. It, it was, it was, yeah, it was already a little late. Uh, so uh, instead he will uh, be joining us uh, on uh, Saturday itself, when we're going to oh, be doing okay. the pubcast, uh, they'll be able to broadcast in from uh, uh, the center where they'll uh, they'll all be gathering, I believe, after Fantastic. the walk. Fantastic. So there you go. Ah, you're over 1,000 subs. You're not rich yet, <laughs> says PNC. Yeah. You're not over. Not rich no. yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Get there, no. but not yet. <laughs> I think we've made uh, $18. <laughs> Woo earned, earned. We didn't make it. If you make it, you go to jail because that's called counterfeiting. Yes. I don't yes. make money. I earn it. <laughs> I, I do get a kick. What out are you of, doing? Here's how you can make money. Don't do that. Yes. What are you doing in the basement, Bobby? I'm making money, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. How are you doing that? Don't ask. <laughs> don't, don't ask how I do that. Uh, all right. Uh, while we're waiting for our guests to arrive, uh, get some cubs because, uh, uh, of course, there's some uh, big news going out out there with regard to the uh, NSICOP report. Um, yes, uh, not yesterday, but two days ago, uh, Elizabeth May had a chance to read the report. Uh, from what I've been reading in uh, the press, it seems like they had to get and yet another security level clearance because from what I was reading in the articles, Miss May had to be cleared for this one and Mr. Singh as well. And Mr. Pasha's getting a serious this clearance. So I'm wondering if there was a level even higher than what they needed to see the David Johnston report mm. or whether or not those clearances don't only last for a certain uh, amount of time. Um, but uh, there's a little clip there, Mr. Grizzly, I have. And uh, she gave her I feedback, which was, which was really interesting. Um, and the other thing is um, we... A gentle correction on us. We misreported something. I found out more information. Oh. Uh, it seems it seems that especially the 11 members of NSACOP, when they joined NSACOP, they actually signed something where they waive their parliamentary privileges. So oh. the thing that we've been saying, saying, yeah. you know, if the conservatives want to, they can because they got their two M members. Apparently they can't. Okay. Um, so they, they signed it away. Remember. So when Andrew Coyne was uh, writing in his article, uh, somebody first, somebody would have to leak it. It seems that it can't be those two those two so also all those members on the committee actually sign that away they get that they can't see it and they can't go into the parliament and abuse of the parliamentary privilege and just drop it that's that's why um, they keep insisting the pm release the information because yes the one who technically could mm -hmm. so that part now makes sense yeah uh so just what you don't we got it wrong we're gonna get things and, we wrong want, and we're facts team. first yeah. so we wanted you to know that um all right uh, but then, uh, like his PNC bio goes, well, that explains PP. Well, then it makes it, but that makes it even more so now because now we have a situation. If it can't be such mm -hmm. that those two and that PP is the only one that can and PP won't see it, it really means that PP does not want to know what's going on in his own party. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a, yeah. that's a and tell. Mr. Singh has been raking him over the coals for this as well. Good. Uh, 
But uh, so Mr. Singh apparently saw the documents on Wednesday and still hasn't uh, said what he had to say about it. He will be coming out at around 3.15 this afternoon, okay. Eastern time, to be able to give his, uh, his take on it. Uh, but Mr. Grizzly, if you have a Miss May. I do indeed. Let's do All it. Right. Only a small number of MPs with top secret security clearance can read the original report. And Elizabeth May is one of them. I found myself looking around at colleagues wondering who could it be, who would sell out this country? Before she read it. I would describe myself before reading the report as good and freaked out. But she says she came away reassured. I can say, I have no worries about anyone in the House of Commons. There is no list of MPs who have shown disloyalty to Canada. Speculation has run rampant since last week when a cross-party committee of MPs and senators released a heavily redacted report alleging some parliamentarians were wittingly or semi-wittingly helping foreign governments meddle in Canadian affairs. May says no sitting MP is accused of knowing collusion. Saying as I do that I'm relieved does not mean that there is nothing to see here, folks. She says the report does mention one unnamed former MP who did knowingly give privileged information to a foreign operative. This individual was entirely aware of the circumstances and was witting. That person, former MP, whose name is not included in the report, should be fully investigated and prosecuted. May says there is a small group of MPs who may have been compromised by foreign governments for example, in party nomination races. I want to make certain that there is none of my MPs which has any kind of implication with the foreign and hostile power. Today, bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet says he's getting clearance to read the report. I feel this is my duty. And the PM went after the leader of the opposition for not doing the same. Elizabeth May uh, took on her responsibilities as party leader. Uh, got her security clearance and did the work. Mr. Polyev should do that too. He is choosing ignorance so he can play partisan politics. But Trudeau's number two asked twice if the Liberals would expel any caucus member who knowingly worked for a foreign power, refused to answer. Evan, a lot of people might be wondering why they're only hearing these details now to the extent that they're details and why they're hearing it from the leader of the Green Party. Well, the leader of the Green Party, Elizabeth May, was able to read this report because she has the very highest security clearance, and therefore she can. And Jagmeet Singh, who also has a high clearance, plans to read it himself tomorrow. But she also made it clear, Ian, that she read it with a view to communicating as much of it as she could to the public without breaking laws. And so for that reason, she coordinated with the Privy Council uh, to find out just exactly how much she could say. And that's really the reason for the very measured tone of the comments that we saw today. Evan Dyer in Ottawa. Okay, so we learned a couple of things there, right? Mm -hmm. All that Pierre has been saying, well, if I read it, I can't say anything about it. Uh, we just learned from what Elizabeth May does, uh, you can read it. Then you can go talk to the clerk of the Privy Council and say, I'd like to say this, this, and the clerk of the Privy Council will tell you whether you can, whether you can't. Exactly. So it's not that you can't say anything. That was always a lie that you'll be 100% gagged. You can speak to it. In limited ways. Limited ways, yes. Right. So uh, again, uh, now when Elizabeth May came out with her comment, um, Mr. Grizzly, if you would put this up on the screen, um, some people have decided to choose to do this and try to remind us of this moment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. In order to discredit her. Mm -hmm. So uh, this moment here for people who are listening at home is when she was at uh, the press gallery dinner at the Canadian, then Canadian Museum of Civilization. And according to Elizabeth May, she had got back after some long travel and was very fatigued and made a bit of a speech that was maybe um, out of character that we would mm -hmm. expect for Elizabeth May, a little, little advice. Lisa Raitt had come up to say, you know, okay, you probably should get off the stage now. And then, of course, uh, some people are going, wow, stellar. Gee, we can't really. Mm -hmm. Like that's like yeah, this one moment like destroyed yeah, one moment in time that encapsulates an entire life, right? Yes, <laughs> God, I, I hate when people do that. 
let, let us let us remind yeah. Elizabeth May was named by fellow MPs, her peers, as Parliamentary Note of the Year in 2012, the hardest working MP in 2013, the best orator in 2014, and most knowledgeable in 2020. In 2010, Newsweek named her as one of the world's most influential women. Okay. So let's let's boil down, let's let's toss all of that aside and boil it down to one single moment in time. And therefore, we can't we we can't respect anything that she says whatsoever. Fuck! I hate people like that. That that I really uh, get yeah. angry about that. Uh, I, I trust me. I told them that. Uh, I told them. I they, they got an invitation to run an ultra marathon off of the world off the world's shortest pier. Good for that. Uh, it's so, like it's like the same people who keep bringing up blackface. Yeah. Every single time they keep going back to that, and it's like, guess what? You're the one committing the sin here. You're the one who keeps bringing that trope up. You, you think a single moment in a man's life encapsulates his entire life? Uh, I can't stand that. I can't yeah. stand it. Uh, now, we had uh, yesterday also, I wish I could find it, uh, it was David McGinty, uh, who mm. is the head, the chair of, Ensicop, of yes. the Ensicop Committee, uh, came out yesterday and... Uh, had some interesting words. Here we go, Mr. Grizzly. I've got uh, the clip for you there um, to share with Canadians. And uh, the Prime Minister's tone in that previous video is really starting to get it. And as you can see, um, Mr. Uh, Blanchette, you know, turned mm -hmm. around and said, it's my duty. Yes. So yeah. why can't so, so care? Again, I think it's remember, the same thing. Remember the party, Yves-Francois Blanchette, is, is a representative thereof. Remember what that party's uh, M.O. is. And he felt that it was his duty to Canada. So that's telling. Okay, this is really weird. The link is not sending to him. Uh, okay, just... Hold on, hold on. I will keep doing it. Just keep talking and I, I will okay. try again. Well, what I was going to say is, is suggest is I can resend you the link if you need to, but I don't know. Maybe it's getting filtered through his, uh, I don't know. I, anyway, right. uh, let's just take a look at this clip of um, David McGinty. Part of the reason for your committee is to provide some clarity as to what's happening in security intelligence spaces yes. so that not everything happens behind closed doors. Yes. We now know Elizabeth May has read the report. She interprets it quite differently than I think most of us have interpreted it, and I think yes. maybe than you intended it to be interpreted. Can you help us know, I know you haven't seen her comments yet, sure. but will you, if you read her comments and you feel like she's interpreting that report wrongly, will you offer that clarity? First, first, first of all, when we do our work, we don't intend it to be communicated one way or another. We just do the work. When we come to ground and what we're going to say is predicated on hours of deliberations and a lot of it confidential and a classified material. So we don't design it with a message track. This is not a communications exercise, huh? This is a national security and intelligence review process. I don't retain outside communications expertise on really on how to position the message track. That's what politicians do, I get it. This is a different kind of process. This is why this is so unique and it's the first time since the War Committee, I think of 1942, when we have politicians coming together to deal with these sensitive issues. Because we don't game it out. We do the work. Now, if, if people have read the review, I don't think they can come to some of the conclusions that were being bandied about over the last five or six days. Right now, Ms. May has made some comments. I'm told they're helpful. It's good that we're having the debate. It's good that Canadians are paying attention. And I think it's also good, that question is probably the most important. Are we building trust? in Canadian society, do people think we have this? I think we do. I think we can. We're, we're coming to it. We've called out the government where they've been weak. We've been very clear about it. We've given them a pathway forward. We've been very clear about that. Now it's up to the government, and for that matter, other political party leaders to act how together. How, 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 some of the conclusions that have been bandied about, which ones are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about, the, the, obviously, there's a, a really big focus on who this, who that, who do you have, what do you have, what do you... This is not something that could be divulged based on classified information. Everything that we can say about parliamentarians, again, you keep coming back to parliamentarians. It is a very narrow, narrow strip in this very wide review. This is not intended to be a targeted parliamentary 
review. This is targeting two elections, what happened in those elections, who the malign state actors might be, who we can name, who we cannot name, where it, where it goes, where is foreign interference, is it in our NGOs? Yes. Is it in our boardrooms? Yes. Is it in our community associations? Yes. Should we wake up? Yes. Should we deal with this together? Yes. Can we? Yes. Have we given five, six, seven steps forward? Is Bill C-70 a good, 70 a good start? Yes. I said it last night, two nights ago at the Senate. This is an important, good start to build on. So I, the committee wants to keep it very positive, and the committee wants to see progress. Again, I think our leaders can come together and do this because our committee has come together to do this. Well, I thought uh, that was uh, that was the right response. Right? Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, I need you to talk because nothing, the phone that I'm trying to send, our, our, what, what's happening is that our email, uh, the messages are being sent. Mm-hmm. But the text from the link is appearing in black on a black background, so he can't see it instead oh. of white. So now I'm trying to send it to him by text, but for some reason I can't copy and paste his phone number. <laughs> and using it, the phone is everything tech is not working. I, 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 you know what? I can't use Facebook on the phone to text anything on the mental health walk event page. As soon as I click on something, it disappears. So have you tried? I don't know it. what's going on with Facebook, but man. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I had I had issues this morning working on uh, some edits in YouTube, and it was not saving any of the edits I created, so I had to restart YouTube, which was really frustrating because you sit there and you're doing these things, and then all of a sudden it's gone. Okay, we have them. Bill's here. Oh, finally. Hi, Bill. How you doing? <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> sir, let me uh, let well, me just bring up his page here. Do an I have too. the uh, Bill Jeffrey, the Lonely Man Project, as we did discuss earlier. Or did this, it's written up in the uh, uh, descriptor. Uh, Bill Jeffrey is a gentleman from uh, uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, and he wrote a song called "The Lonely Man," and he has a project that accompanies it. So let's just, without any further ado, oh, let's just bring our guest in because we've had a heck of a time trying to get him here. So good morning, Bill. How you doing? Hey, good morning, guys. Hey How there. Are Very well. How are you? Doing great this morning. Thanks. Uh, sorry about that. For some reason, our, our our links were appearing in black on a black background instead of white, so you couldn't see them. <laughs> That's no problem at all. Technology is great when it works. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, I, I'm going to read a bit of your bio because we didn't get to do it in the intro here. But uh, for the kids and cubs, uh, Mr. Jeffrey is a dedicated Canadian certified counselor and certified personal training specialist with a passion for holistic well-being. He has a master's degree in counseling, psychology, and certification in personal training, and he brings a unique blend of expertise to support clients in achieving their physical and emotional wellness goals. In his counseling practice, Bill provides compassionate and evidence-based therapy to individuals facing a variety of mental health challenges. Driven by a genuine desire to help others thrive, he founded the Lonely Man Project to raise awareness of men's mental health, and he has a very big event going on this mm-hmm. evening. Which is he sold has been out. Act- yes, sold way. out. He has been actively sounding the alarm on the need for services designed for men and changing the conversation around what it means to be a man. So perfect guest for what it is that we are doing here. Outside of his professional initiatives, Bill enjoys songwriting, playing guitar, hitting the gym, and spending time with his wife and two kids. Bill is dedicated to his own ongoing personal growth and is deeply committed to supporting others on their odyssey towards greater health and happiness. So kids and cubs, please put your paws up and give a round of a pause for Mr. Bill Jeffrey. <laughs> Welcome to the Beaver Lodge, sir. Thanks very much. Happy um, to be here. Uh, we start every show, uh, well, me asking Mr. Grizzly how his mental health is doing today, and we do that for our guests too. So how's your mental health doing today? Because I know that there's a lot going on. I must be a little nervous. <laughs> yeah, you know what? My mental health is fantastic today. I'm, we're yes. excited. It's a, it's a big day here in, in Newfoundland Labrador for us. It's a milestone event that we're going to put off tonight that's been a long time in the, in the making. Mm-hmm. All right, Tanner and Vi, I'll tell you this now. <laughs> yeah, I used to live in Gander and St. John's, so. Not from, not from the rock, but military yeah. kid, military. Oh, kid. I gotcha. Yeah. 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 Spent some formative years there from 77 to 80. So uh, the accent never leaves, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. maybe you'd like to tell our audience about your event, please. 
Sure. Our event is called An Evening of Men's Mental Health. Um, we've got Dr. Robert Whitley coming down from McGill University. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a silent auction, of course. It's a, it's a sit down dinner, stuffed chicken breast, real nice, elegant mm. type affair. Um, I've got Dave Dontremont is speaking. So ideally, the, the event is Dr. Whitley is going to give an overview on what's going on for men and boys. Where are we? Why is it happening? Uh, what can we do about it? And then we got three speakers that are going to give three different perspectives on men's mental health. So Dave Dontremont's going to talk from the CEO perspective, um, you know, the boss's perspective that we don't talk a lot about, but like when you're the boss, who do you talk to? Yeah, that's, it's right? very and, true. How do you, how do you separate that from, you know, your home life and your, and your family life and how it kind of all rolls in together. So his talk is going to be called unraveling. Uh, then we've got Audrey Wade speaking and Audrey lost her son to suicide three years ago. He was only 19. That's hard. So she's going to talk from the, the mom's perspective. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and, uh, um, you know, where, where the lonely man project came from and, uh, where we're headed going forward, the need for, for men's services. All right. Indeed. Very much needed. Uh uh, very much did... needed and very much, sorry, just give me a sec here, very, very much needed and very much neglected up until, I think, very recently. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the idea for the event come about? Well, <clears throat> I started the Lonely Man Project. Actually, you know, the, the full picture for me, I had depression 20-odd um, years ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll speak a bit about it tonight at the event, but, um, you know, I was a tough guy back in the day. I wrestled heavyweight with the Varsity Seahawks at Memorial University. You know, I bounced downtown. You know, I was your proverbial tough guy. So we moved to, uh, I went to Halifax to go to school up there. I met my wife now, my girlfriend then, I guess, up there. And then we moved to Toronto. And when I moved up there, I was in the best shape of my life. 600-pound uh, deadlift. I was, you know, oh, wow. got, yeah, it was like a, you know, it was like a monster type of thing, you know, real, real physically active and fit. Um, I went out and played some touch football with some computer guys that I was working with at the time, and I popped a disc. Mm. So, of course, mm. being from Newfoundland, you don't mention the word disability 20 odd years ago was a dirty word. So I tried to power through it like we do with our, our physical and our mental health as men. And uh, about eight months into it, um, I bumped into the nurse at, at work and she's like, how long have you been like this? And I said, about eight months. She said, can't be here. Go home. Because at that point, I was kind of dragging my leg behind me. I had, you know, sciatica down through the leg. The pain was, uh, yeah. was, was absolutely terrible. So it turned out I needed surgery. It wasn't getting any better. And in the 18 months that it, it took, I went from the best shape of my life to the worst shape of my life. Yep. Up mm -hmm. to about 400 pounds. And uh, yeah. in the meantime, I'd morphed into this other guy, and I didn't realize it. No, it happens slowly, incrementally, right? You don't know it, it and then all of a sudden, somebody might Bang. hold up a mirror and show you what you look like because you don't see it, right? That's exactly what happened. So my sister was doing a counseling program in the States and uh, she came up to visit. And after you know a few hours, she's like, so how long have you had depression? And I'm like, what have I got to be depressed? Or what are you talking about? I'm here in Toronto. I got my J's. I got my Leafs. I got a great job, beautiful girlfriend. Everything's going fantastic. What have I got to be depressed about? It's like that's And then not... she started pointing out some things like, you know, I was at Walmart and I said something to the guy beside me because his stuff was too close to mine on the belt. And I rolled down my window on the 401, a little bit of road rage mm -hmm. the guy next to me. Um, you know, you go to Costco and the guy didn't use a signal light on the way. And so you go up and you, and you say something to him, yeah. none of which was me. Right. Right? I was very, very short. And, and you know, right, really, I was mean to my girlfriend at that point. But I didn't realize it. I didn't know that I was this guy. So everybody around me could see it. But I couldn't see it. And, I, you know, my girlfriend told me I wasn't listening to her. So to my benefit, and God love her, she stuck with me through it. But that sent me on, a, on a, a trip to try and figure out what happened and how could this happen to me. Again, I was, I was a tough guy. I, you know, I can power through anything. Not a problem. And yet I couldn't get through this. So I did some counseling, uh, took some antidepressants, you know, got past my, my depression and uh, returned to myself, which is the, you know, the, the one big hope that we have when it comes to men's mental health. You can manage a lot of this once you take the, the bull by the horns. And so anyway, I wanted to understand as much as I could. So I started reading. I started, you know, watching everything I could I could watch, try to get as much information as I could. And then I eventually I said, you know what, I want to, this is what I want to do. I want to work in this. So I came all the way around and um, I applied here at the university. We moved back home and uh, 
I want to go do the counseling psychology program. And I applied and I didn't get in. I'm like, what do mm-hmm. you mean I didn't get in? I get in everything. I don't understand what's going mm-hmm. on here. Mm-hmm. So the, at that point, the program here was more for teachers. And mm-hmm. so teachers were coming through and they were becoming guidance counselors. So I actually went back and I did a, an adult education degree to get into the master's program. So eventually I got into the program and uh, um, graduated 2016, I guess. Mm-hmm. And of course, I was very interested in men's mental health. So while I was doing the program the year earlier, I also ran a program here for the kids, a soccer program after school uh, for five years. And during one span back in 2015, I had three different ladies come up to me in the gym. Now, they didn't come up together. This is all three separate conversations. Mm-hmm. I'd be studying. I was just a chunky guy by the scoreboard but on Saturdays. that was over reading his books. And uh, these three ladies came up to me over the 11-week span, and they all told me a similar story about their husbands. Mm-hmm. So their husbands were all coaching for me in the program. And they come up and say, like, that's not the guy who's at home. Like, he's not slapping high fives. We're not laughing at home. In fact, they all said something similar to the effect of we're all walking on eggshells. Mm-hmm. Right. And when I mentioned male depression, they came back with the same thing, saying, well, it can't be depression because he's really angry. Mm-hmm. And I realized, I said, well, yeah, we've never had a campaign to tell people that, you know, the hallmark of male depression is anger. Yes. Yeah, right, no, you that's absolutely going, what it is. Yeah. yeah, you see somebody going crazy in a, about a parking spot out, outside of the mall. You don't say, geez, you know, maybe he's depressed and this is his last straw. You say, what, a, what an idiot. Nah, what an arsehole. Yeah, yeah and that's what one of these ladies actually said. She said, my husband turned into an arsehole. Yeah. And I, I knew him for a while. I said, well, how long have you been with him? And she said, 20 years. I said, 20 years, and he just now turned into an arsehole. I mm-hmm. think maybe there's something else going on here. Something. Something's a little off. New behavior. So, all three, all three end up getting diagnosed with depression later on. And unfortunately, one of the couples actually split up uh, because of it. And it was probably preventable. But that's where the Lonely Man Project idea came from. So I took a run with the government and I said, look, like, this is our problem with men and boys here. Mm-hmm. And we don't have supports for them. Let no, me do some don't. research for you and I can show you what's here. And they weren't interested in it. So I did the research anyway and mm-hmm. presented it to them. I call it Men at Risk. And, you know, it was very, all the stats were there. The evidence is, is this has been evidence-based for quite a, quite a while. And they really didn't want to move on it. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So what else can I do? They said, well, maybe if you write a program directed at men and, you know, a community organization submits it as opposed to an individual, you know, they can have a look at that. I said, okay, that's, that's what I did. I got a job at a community agency here in town. And I wrote a program that I called Man Up because I wanted to change the meaning of Man Up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, they submitted it and ideally it came back and they said, you know, can it be more broad based? They wanted to have women included and they, you know, the credit, the agency's credit, they went back and said, well, we can run a program for women as well. Not a problem. But what we're seeing is we need these men in the room together. Yes. And so they declined to fund it. <sighs> so I took another step back and said, okay, so we're not doing the oh research. We're not going to look at the program. And, you know, fast forward to the, uh, you know, 2020 and the oil and gas collapse, and that program would have fit to a T mm-hmm. here in St. Yes. John's because it was targeted at men who were recently unemployed to help maintain their mental health while they were off. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I digress. So I said, how else can I attack this problem? So I said, I'm going to write a song. So I wrote The Lonely Man, and that was based on my own experience and a lot of the men that I'd worked with up to that point. And, you know, it tells more of the story of The Lonely Man and the common elements of of men that are, are suffering from uh, mental mental health issues and struggling. You know, here's dad, he looks great on the outside, his job is great, everything looks wonderful, and on the inside he's just in turmoil. Yeah. So I wrote that song and uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to do a crowdfunding piece and if we get support for this, then we're going to push forward with it. And if we don't, then, you know, you're, you're kind of really, it's not the time for it or, you know, nobody's that interested right now, it's going to be really hard to sell. <laughs> So anyway, in short order, we got enough money to go to Nashville and record it. I just put and a so link to it in the chat there for anybody who wants to have oh, a look great. at the video. So we uh, we went to Nashville and, and recorded the thing and uh, came back, released it. Um, got a lot of uh, uptake, uh, more uptake in Nova Scotia than we did in Newfoundland, mm-hmm. which, was, which was different. It was number one song on a, a station up there. And uh, <clears throat> from there, the Lonely Man Project was born. So it's been a comedy of errors all the way through, like COVID really knocked the stuffing out of us, like mm-hmm. a lot of things. 
I had a couple of heart attacks in the middle. Oh, they kind of, they kind of, kind of threw us off, yeah. So, uh, you know, this this event we're having tonight is is something I wanted to do two years ago, but the, the health didn't allow for it. But this is a big, the big major spotlight, first one we've ever had in Newfoundland and Labrador on men's mental health. Well, and this is, this is, you know, the whole point of our mental health walk is to stress the fact that there's little to no support for men, number one. And number two, as you said, so many men are walking around with depression and have no idea. Yeah. And, and so many, so many of the problems that we have with, with society, I think, can go back to mental health issues. Now, I'm, I'm not saying everything, but a great number of them uh, goes back to that. It's like, because the most people I meet are pretty even keeled individuals. But I see depression, because, you know, I've been battling depression for 44 years and anxiety. And I, I kept, you know, when I first was diagnosed back in the 90s and said, you've, you've been like this for a very long time. What was, you know, we, we know my, my breaking point, if you will. We know what my cause was, but we'll get into that some other day. But um, <clears throat> when I first came out with depression and talked to people about it, I got that, what do you have to be depressed about? I'm like, that's not what it is. It's the brain chemistry is not working properly. That's why I'm angry all the time. That's why I can't get out of bed. That's why some days at work, I want to crawl under my desk and weep. And I try and explain that to people in the 90s and nobody, oh, you're re being ridiculous. You got a good job. You got a good place to live. You're earning good money. I'm like, okay. So then I just clammed up about it. I didn't exactly. talk about it. And I went on medication and I went on uh, Paxil. I'm mm. not sure if you're familiar with that one. But uh, that was not a good medication for Mr. Paul here. The old grizzly bear damn near uh, said goodnight to the planet. And I talked about it the other day on Dean's show. And I was on that medication at the time that I went in, called a bunch of people to say goodbye. My cousin came and rescued me and, you know, I'm still here as a result. I went off that medication and then I said, I'm not going back on medication. And I didn't until February of 2020. Right before the world shut down. <laughs> and, and it was because I was out on a Saturday night uh, at, a, at a, fair, a charity fundraising event. And I, I've got a photo of me from that night. And I look older there. I look 10 years older in that photo than I do right now. And that's four, five years ago, four years ago, uh, four years ago. And I was talking with a friend of mine who was a physician and said, you should take, you should try the Zoloft. I think it will work for you. She said, I'm on it right now. And without it, I don't know if I'd be able to cope. And I'm like, really? She goes, here's the, here's the thing to remember. If it doesn't work out for you, you can stop and everything goes back to the way it is. You'll still be you. And I went, that's what I needed to hear. It was not just from a doctor, but it was from a doctor that is a close, personal, dear friend of mine. It, it just gave me a little bit, you know, because my first interaction with medication did not go well. So I was really leery about trying it again because I thought, oh, I'll go a little off the rocker. I might become thoughts of, of suicidal ideation. You know, all of that. I got lucky. I got a good medication with my doctor. I had a long conversation with him and he said, no, let's go. Let's try this. I'm on 50 milligrams, like the smallest dose you can take, basically. And it's made a tremendous difference in my life. I still have my moments, you know, when yeah. you have a lifelong battle with it. In my case, it's, it's kind of endemic. It's, it, I don't think it's ever going to be cured per se, but I, I, I work on it. I do therapy. I meditate. I exercise. I, I take my beautiful big dog here for a walk <laughs> frequently. Let's see if I can get her on the camera. Oh, she's right in the lens right now. So I don't think I'll put her on. <laughs> But uh, it, it's, it's the, the difference it's made in my life is, is night and day. Anybody who knew me back then can see the difference now. Do I have things to work on? Yeah, I do. Because I've got 40, plus, 40 years of untreated depression. So breaking some old habits, learning how to deal with things in a new manner. Uh, there, there, there's a lot of work I still have to do. But I'm happy to do it and I'm eager to do it. But the thing that, you know, that like you just said, that the supports aren't there for us. And like you said, 20 years ago, big tough fella, you don't talk about these things. Oh. And, and I'm dumb enough too, that I even, back in 2017, I tore my right shoulder. I was in the gym, working out, doing shrugs, and I go, oh, that hurt. Oh, I got three more sets to do, I'll power through. 
then it was eight, eight weeks of absolute freaking agony. Agony. And for some reason, I pushed on for two more years, um, three more years before I decided, okay, it's time to, time to fix all of this because I was, you know, I was trying to do the whole holistic, let's just exercise, let's just eat right, let's just, that's not, you need, there's more to it. It's, you need a full frontal assault and you need therapy, maybe medication. I'm not saying it works for everybody and I'm not telling people to take it, but consider it. Put it on the, the option that you think maybe this will help. But the, the thing is, it's, it's not just awareness. It's we need support. And what well, you're doing, sir, it's like I salute you because this is what we're trying to create something similar. I mean, I don't have your educational background. And nor do I have the financial wherewithal to be able to go out and pursue it. But, you know, <laughs> I really do appreciate what you're doing. Well, I appreciate that. One of the, uh, you know, the, the things we tell men is that you're not alone. Right? You don't, you come out and talk, you don't need to deal with this on your own. Mm -hmm. right? Yep. And then we don't provide them with any supports or programs. Forcing them to do exactly what we just said you don't need to do, which is figure it out on your own. Right. Exactly. Right. That's, that's a huge, that's a huge problem. Um, you know, we talk about our physical health and our mental health, you know, it's ingrained in a lot of us, right. To power through things. So much like your shoulder, when I had a heart attack, I had pain for seven hours. Yeah. I didn't go to the hospital until the guy was absolutely clear what it was. So I had, you know, pain in the lower abdomen and I thought it was coffee, you know, stretched around for a bit and took Tums at work trying to, get through it came home lie down and my wife was like hey, why are you lying down and i said i got this bad heartburn for the last couple hours okay well we should probably go over to the hospital i said nah it's fine it'll pass so i laid there and a couple hours later it you know progressed i had pain in both triceps eventually i got pain in the jaw got a bit of shortness of breath i said okay fine if it'll shut you up we'll go over <laughs> and so we did <laughs> and uh, it turns out i had like nine blockages oh, oh my word God. And had, had had a heart attack. So, you know, when it comes to men, it's not just our mental health. It's our, physical, our physical health that we put it off. Yeah, and we we got to stop doing that. But, you know, we look at it and we blame it on a lot of men and say it's an individual thing. No, this is a societal issue. It is. Right? We've built men to be like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Which we means have. we need to help to adjust men to be where they need to be. Yeah. It's really weird. It's like there's a lot of things you mentioned that's similar. I, I was a dance student and busted up my knee. And uh, same, same as you, I went from dance and busted up so much that I couldn't put weight on it and whatnot. And I was on my you know, soft tissue blood and I was on my back for about three months. But when you're dancing 40 hours a week, you expend a lot of energy. So you eat a lot of food. Yeah. Well, when your body stops moving all of a sudden, your body doesn't, your body doesn't stop craving the food all of a sudden. And same, same as you, I went from the best shape of my life to the most I've ever weighed in my entire life in three months. Wow. Poof. It's a, it's, yeah, it's not fun. It's a really weird situation. Um, now, one of the reasons you are doing all of this is to start a men's resource center, according uh, to your website. Could you it tell is. us a little bit about that project? Well, <clears throat> here in Newfoundland, we, there's no organization that has a mandate for men. Okay. So we, I mean, we've got a lot of, lot of work to do. No. <laughs> we've got you know, a lot of work to do. Just, you know, unless there's funding provided... You know, the organizations aren't necessarily looking to push into new realms. So, you know, I have no doubt when they do make funding available for men's programs here, every organization is going to want to have a program mm -hmm. mm. because they're going to bring money into their organization. But that doesn't mean that they're dedicated to men's mental health. That means you want to bring some more funds into the organization. So for me, the, you know, a lot, what I hear a lot from women and from men is that the men are saying, like, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have a problem. And if I didn't, where would I go anyway? Yeah. Where would I and, go? And they're not wrong. Like here in St. John's, we have uh, two drop-in centers for women, drop-in counseling. Men don't have any. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But our suicide rate last year was 80% male. Right. And in 2020, our suicide rate was 82% male. Right. Yeah. We don't have a drop-in center for these guys to go in and just talk. So the Men's Resource Center is really to be a hub to run these programs through. It's going to be a place for men and, you know, men of all different stripes and sexualities and creeds and just a place for men that we can start to address some of these inequalities in society and where men can feel safe and comfortable to come in and, and talk about what's mm -hmm. going on. Run your men's mm -hmm. groups, run your programs, 
you know, run some programs for, for partners who are struggling with the men to try and get them to get some help. You know, mm -hmm. but, but it has to be run through an organization if it's going to be done effectively. Yeah. One of the things about your website, which is really great, is that you've put up some statistics for people who want to consult uh, and find out more about uh, the issue you have here. 72% of Canadian men have unhealthy habits, putting them at risk for chronic conditions and diseases. That's according to the Canadian Men Health Foundation. Uh, on average, approximately 4,000 Canadians take their own life each year. Of those suicides, 75% are men. Uh, approximately 1 million Canadian men suffer from major depression each year. Canadian Indigenous men have a suicide rate that is double that of the Canadian national average, with Inuit men being 11 times the national average. Yeah. It's just, there's just so much. Uh, in 2019, 1,666,200 Canadian men over the age of 15, roughly 9% of the male population, reported that they have seriously contemplated suicide in their lifetime. I, I, we're, 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 we're failing our men and we're failing our boys specifically. Yes, and you have a section on your, your, your page uh, as well about the boys. And I was wondering, like, we've been talking about men, but we haven't talked much about, uh, about young boys and children yet. Um, I was wondering if you had anything that to, to share uh, with our audience. Well, you about know that. What? I do because um, I actually went in uh, last summer. I spoke at a golf tournament um, for a, a kid who had you know, completed suicide and uh, I guess I went a little off script. Little, mm -hmm. <laughs> I tend to do that. I can talk all day. I've seen me do it, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, you know, I really spoke from the heart as a golf tournament. So um, about two months ago, I had a principal who was in attendance ask me if I would come in and and speak to your high school boys, do an informal session with them. So I said absolutely. Like we got a lot of work to do with our boys, and you know, I wanted to have a gauge of what exactly we're we're looking at in there. So I went into the school and. Uh, First thing I did was put on the board, be a man. I said, okay. I said, lads, what does this mean to you? And it was just the boys in the room and the guy, male guidance counselor was there with us. And I got the same old mantras that we would have had. You know, you're going to be tough. You're going to be competitive. Right? One kid actually said it means beating up other kids. Mm. Right? That same type of you know traditional masculinity that mm. we were all brought up with. And it you know, dawned on me in that moment that like, we haven't done any work with the boys in schools like i got a daughter who's 20 and a son who's 19 and you know my daughter came out of school and the world's her oyster she can be anything she wants and you know we've done a lot of work on that which is fantastic we have more work to do but on the boys side we didn't do anything mm -hmm. so my son's coming out much like i came out you know traditional male jobs mm -hmm. he's not looking at nursing in these other other areas so i spent the session redefining what it means to be a man that's what i really think we need to do with men um we got into talking about the toxic masculinity and I absolutely hate that term. Mm -hmm. I just not. And I said to the boys, like there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a man, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with being a young man. You know, you should be proud of it. Now, are there behaviors that are not going to serve us well? Oh yeah, absolutely. So I asked them when they, they told me, you know, what being a man means, I said, who exemplifies that? And first name came out was the rock. Right? And I love the rock. The rock's great. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So we, we, we did our session and we, we talked about behaviors that would help moving us forward. And at the end, you know, I said, can we all agree that these behaviors that you've listed before are not going to serve us well as men? But we did. So we crossed it out and we made a list of new behaviors, you know, which would be seeking help. And I said, who, you know, look at, look at the name that you gave us. And I circled it. And I said, now, would it surprise you to know that this guy also had mental health issues and is openly talking about it? And they were shocked. Mm -hmm. I said, so it is possible to be you know, strong and competitive and want to win in hockey mm -hmm. and play your sports and be a man, but also to be able to talk about your feelings, mm -hmm. talk about what's going on in your life and get that help and help others. And so that really opened up the door to them. But when I spoke about the masculinity piece, you could, you could almost feel the weight being lifted off of them. Mm -hmm. um, Right. You could feel it. The, once I said, you know, we're not toxic. It's OK to be man because we've really put a shame and a guilt on these young fellas, mm -hmm. of, you know, slap the label on who they are. And yeah. And that can affect, you know, uh, uh, when you get that slapped on you as a young person, that'll stick with you forever. And it, it only does. it's like a festering wound. It doesn't heal on its own. It just gets no. worse and worse and worse. 
and we're not giving them alternatives. So these guys are heading to the internet, and yeah. they're going to Andrew Tate. Yeah, they're going to Jordan Peterson. Now you yeah. know some of Jordan Peterson says makes sense. A very intelligent, articulate man. So when he stays in his lane, he's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but he, he veers sometimes off. he veers off. Yeah. Yeah. Now Andrew Tate, you know, he's made a fortune on pushing traditional masculinity. Yeah. You know? And and that's exactly what he's doing. I saw one of his videos saying, uh, um, you know, you don't feel like getting up. Who cares? You're a man. You get up and you go to work. I'm like, what year is this? Yeah. Right. Of course it matters how you feel. What are you talking about? But we haven't given these young fellas any alternatives. Um, you know, I always say it's not toxic masculinity is the problem. It's a lack of masculinity is our problem. Like here in Newfoundland, you look at the at the school system, we've got our guidance councils, 80% are women. Mm -hmm. Then you've got your your teachers, you know, there's a sprinkling in K to six. Right? We're hurting for masculinity. Um, I had a yeah, radio I show host I just, here. Sorry, I didn't have a male teacher until grade eight. Yeah. In my life. Mm, yeah, it's problematic. Grade, grade four. A school principal, yes, but no male teacher until grade eight. Mm. I didn't, in fact, I didn't even know men taught until grade eight. Well, I, I had a, a teacher, <laughs> in seriously, Kelly, but uh, he was a, a toxic individual in that he, he, he'd walk, you know, sit up straight, hit in the back of the head with a ruler, snap you, like, I mean, right. physical abuse. Mm. Yeah. And at the time, you, many parents in the seventies would go, well, you know, that's because you weren't, you weren't, you know, that that's let that teacher teach you a lesson. You were not behaving properly in this class. I'm like, so we actually condoned our teachers hitting our own children at the time because that was the thought process, right? I'm not upset about it. It happened. It's over. I've moved on. But it's like, can we fix things so that doesn't happen in the future for children? Teachers should never hit a child. Now, a child should never hit a teacher either. But if a child does that, let's, let's take a closer look at what's happening because that's not normal behavior from a child. No, it's not. We had a, uh, I had a radio show here, a radio show host here, um, talking about violence against women. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> so, you know, men take your sons aside and have those conversations and you no, know, absolutely. Yeah. But I wrote to him in direct message and said, like, you're assuming that everybody has a father at home. That's the other thing. And you're assuming that every father at home is not, not involved in violence against women. Mm -hmm. right. That's a big assumption to make. Yeah. So right. we've got a lack of masculinity and lack of role models for these these kids that are coming up through. And as they're going out, they're looking, saying, okay, who who do I gravitate towards? You know, I even look at Donald Trump, bring bring the Trumper into it. Jesus. You know, when he when he won the election back in 2016, right? The next day I was watching the speech from Hillary Clinton. Well, Hillary reached out to the girls and said, Know that you're loved and all this other stuff. And she left it at that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is fine. But what's that telling the boys? So yeah, you're disposable. Two, there's two options, and she's with the girls. Who's for me? Yeah. I guess I'm with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's what we're doing by default. So we got a lot of work to do in in the in the men and boys area, um, and it starts in the school system. We need to get into the schools and start doing this work on a on a younger level. You know, there's different age groups. You know, targeting men with one umbrella approach is not working either because we're different no. generations. Yeah. Like we got, you know, suicide rate is, you know, climbing in the, in the older group, you know, I'm 51 now. And, uh, you know, when I'm learning, I, you know, I, I looked at the suicide rates when I started this, I'm like, why is that, that age group so prevalent? I don't understand. And now that I'm 51, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my kids are 19 and 20. And a lot of the guys I'm seeing coming into my, into my uh, practice, they lack purpose now. Because yeah. they were always brought up to be purpose driven. So they were dads and they were husbands and they were providers. And all of a sudden the kids are moving on. They don't quite need dad like they used to. They're, you know, they're always going to need him to some extent, but he doesn't have a purpose anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to help these guys find what they're, why they're still here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it reminds me of a story I read about a gentleman who, uh, when he was very young, decided he wanted to retire at 50. This story is about 30 years old. And so he worked really hard his li whole life. He saved, he saved, he scrimped, he put his money together and he retired at 48 actually. And he was financially set for the rest of his life. And he didn't make it to 55. He leapt off the Golden Gate Bridge because he no longer had a purpose. He had nothing to do every day. He had no purpose in this world. He had nothing to get up and look forward to. He didn't have a job to go to because he was retired. 
family didn't, he didn't have, you know, he, his family didn't need him because they were financially well off. His peer group was still working. They were all still at work. I had a friend who retired at 35 and he was back to work two years later. And I said, why? He goes, it's not about the money. He goes, I was bored out of my tree. He goes, sure, I have my neighbors who are all in their 70s and they're retired. All they want to do is play golf and drink beer all day. He goes, I don't, I have other interests. All of my friends in my peer group, in my age group, are all at work. Yeah. So he went back to work because he just, he's like, this is going to kill me. And he knew it. He knew smart. it would kill him. He was a, he's a smart guy. He's very yeah. self-aware. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, lack of purpose is a... It's huge. It's yeah. huge. It's massive. It's big, I'm struggling with that right now because on Monday, I don't know what I'm doing. My contract ends tomorrow. I don't know what I'm doing on Monday. My employer is supposed to, is trying to find me more work. They're, they want to send me back out into the service, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. But I'm struggling with that right now. That being said, my mental health is surprisingly good right now. But I think this little mutt here has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. uh, my very supportive wife has a lot to do with it. You know, there's there's lots of good. Th okay, Lola, sorry. <laughs> She's just trying to get right up on top of me here. Come on, come on. Okay, there we um, go. Bill, uh, I was wondering, because uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I just wanted to ask you before, uh, would you give us permission to actually play your song for our viewers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Good. I, I can, can uh, end with that. I'm not sure uh, how much uh, time there is. Yeah, no, I wrote the song and uh, released it, and I encourage yeah. as many people who want to share it. It's amazing how many uh, people you can reach, and when it comes to men's mental health, you don't know you're reaching them. Mm -hmm. like I hear from people that, you know, we reached four years ago. Oh, yeah. I played this song up at uh, Kim Shore Music Festival in Halifax. That's where I debuted it, I guess, on the open mic stage up there. And uh, I still remember, like, there was a man. He must have been 600 pounds. He's a really big man. It's like a mountain coming down the side after I finished playing. I just saw him walking down from the, from the uh, grandstand area there. And he came over and tears in his eyes. And he, he shook my hand. And he said, you don't know how much that song meant to me. Oh, wow. So it really resonates with a lot of guys, and it should because it's really the common elements that a lot of guys are going through. Well, I'm going to do a little shameless self-promotion here. I have a, an ASMR mental health YouTube channel. I'm going to put a link in the chat here for those who are, who are new to the show. Uh, I, I try and do it every Monday at 9 p.m. It's 30 to 40 minutes where I just come on and I talk in a soft, soothing voice about my mental health challenges and the things that I do to get me through. And how, how your mental health can be affected from a hundred different things. It's yeah. not one thing. It's a hundred different things that can affect it. So, yeah, if you ever, ever want to check that out, it's the links in the chat there. Yeah, I'm going to have a look at that. The idea with, with mental health is that we all have it. We don't all have mental illness. That's right. We all have mental health and our mental right. health waivers from day to day. Right. You know, I always, I always, when I do my speaking, I always talk about depression and I, you know, I always liken it to the, you ever see the movie Venom? Yes. Yeah. yes. Movie? I said, that's yep. depression. Mm -hmm. So you got this alien inside of you mm -hmm. and he's trying to come out. And the longer you wait, the more likely he is to come out. And eventually he envelops you. You're no longer in control. Yeah, you're absolutely But right. if you can go get some help and talk about your issues early, it doesn't matter. Is, is your girlfriend broke up with you? Are you having a, a problem at work? Is it financial? Whatever those problems are that you're you're stuck on, you're ruminating on, and you can't move past, you go talk about them early. You're much more likely to keep venom at bay. You know, and I, I talk about, uh, you know, the, look at the Judds. So, I mean, Winona Judd and, and her daughter mm -hmm. were going to go into the Hall of Fame. Yep. You know, and she completed suicide two days before that. Yeah. Yep. Like, does anybody think that she was in control of herself at that point? No. You know, like she would never take that away from her daughter. Mm -hmm. you know, even if she was going to plan it out, logically, she would wait until after that, that date and they'd enjoy that piece. And she didn't two days before. Yeah. I clearly Venom had taken over at that point. She was no longer in control of what she was doing. And that's, that's the, the uh, issue with mental health. It can be fatal. And mm -hmm. we're not saying that enough, but mental health can be fatal. And well, we need to people understand the severity and the the ramifications of not getting help, not just on you, but on the people that you're also leaving behind. Oh, yes. Right? And as we talked earlier, like awareness is a big part. And, you know, I, I certainly understand not being aware of what's going on because I'm, you know, I'm a picture board for it. Mm -hmm. But once you become aware, then you got to take action. 
then the ball is in your court and this thing is manageable and you can move forward and you can live a happy life. And, you know, yes, you know, you might have a persistent depressive disorder. You might have some low grade depression your whole life, but you can manage it and mm, you can feel, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you can feel better. And that's the idea here is, is that there's hope, but if you leave it, it's like anything else, you know, you're, if, it, if it's cancer or anything else, it's going to grow, mm -hmm. it's going to get worse. And, you know, for a lot of men that I see, they're either already gone kaboom in their life. You know, the mm -hmm. wife is left, they're alcoholics, they're gambling, that sort of thing. Or they're pretty damn close. Mm -hmm. And I tell you something I've had recently is I've had a few guys that have been referred to me for marriage counseling. So they're mm -hmm. going to marriage counseling. And That's the first step, right? Well, it is. But I've had the female counselor call and say, I got this guy. I'm seeing this couple. And I'm going to keep her. But he needs to see someone. So I've taken on these these clients and within the first five minutes of talking to them, like, have you ever been screened for depression? Mm -hmm. Right? Last three have been severely depressed. Severely depressed. Now, how can marriage counseling work? Can't right. When you're severely depressed, of course it's not going to work. You're in no. there, you're irritable, you're angry, you're snapping, you're you're seeing everything as as accosting you. You're not and open if, to what's actually going on. And if you're probably there, you're probably there to fix you. Right. So what they're the saying is that problem. this is not going to work. So I'm going to work with her. And can you help this guy to get some help? Because he needs to see someone on his own. And, you know, as you talk about what's going on and you and you say, like, this is the common tenets of you know, depression. This is the characteristics of it. Then they can start to finally see themselves in that mm -hmm. and say, oh, my God, right? how do I fix this? And how do yeah. I fix my marriage or my relationship? Because I've done a lot of damage by not knowing what the heck was going on. Yeah, you have to see the pattern to interrupt it. Yeah. But we jumped to marriage counseling right away. But if you are not mentally ready to do marriage counseling, it's, it ain't going to work. It's a waste of time and money and effort. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's that simple. It really is. You know, something a friend of mine said to me years ago, she was a counselor. Uh, and, and she said a lot of the counselors she worked with just said, oh, oh, he's a hitter. He beat his wife. So throw him out with the trash. Like he's garbage. And she's like, no, that is the wrong approach. That is only going to make it worse because he's never going to be fixed. He's never going to get better and he's going to have children or he's going to affect somebody else in his life. Or and you're just moving another woman to somebody else. He, yeah. he'll, another woman. He's like, no, we have to treat him too. Yes. You can't throw him out. No. And I'd, I'd never heard anybody say that before because I was of the mindset, well, he's scum, he's garbage, throw him out. She said, but. That could be you. I'm like, no, I would never do that. And she goes, depression has a weird way of making you do things that aren't you. Like you said, venom. If you regret it, you have regrets because of depression. It's a thief. It takes your joy and it makes you someone you're not. Yeah. So when it comes to like domestic violence, I mean, we got a lot of men that are domestic violence victims as well. And there's a mm -hmm. whole piece of that, that, you know, those guys aren't getting supported. When it comes to the violence against women, there's a lot of one-offs mm -hmm. in domestic violence. And I always say male mental health is like a balloon, right? And you put enough air into it, it pops. Mm -hmm. You let out a little bit of air every so often, it won't go off. You know, there's no excuse for domestic violence. No, zero. zero excuse. But is there a reason for it? Yes. Yeah. And if there's a reason for it, we can target that reason for it and bring the numbers down. Mm -hmm. But we're too busy and saying, yeah, well, he's a piece of garbage and throw it out. All right, yeah. if we got that guy help beforehand, we prevent that incident from happening. I talked to a guy recently who was, uh, you know, I've known him for, geez, 25 years. Nicest guy you ever want to meet. Mm -hmm. And he was going through a rough stretch, didn't get help. Mm -hmm. And he ended up pushing his wife. She got up in his face. They're having a row. And he pushed her. So now he's got this other big, huge problem. He's never done anything like that. And he mm -hmm. said, Bill, I can't even believe I did it. Right? He's re so regretful. But he was just at a point that he popped. Mm -hmm. So much pressure. So he, It wasn't him, but he did it. Again, inexcusable. Yes. Yeah. But is there a reason? Can we prevent those one-off from happening by yeah. providing services and, and changing the conversation around what it means to be a man? Yeah. I, think I, like that, I like that you mentioned that because a lot of people think if, you, uh, if you're able to explain something that you're excusing it. And it's like, no. 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 That's not excusing something and explaining something is not the same thing. I mean, ideally, if you look at, you know, even the bullying situation. Like if you were getting bullied, Paul, mm -hmm. what's the first thing you want to have happen? Right? Uh, the guy to stop punching you in the head? Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah, that'd right? be nice. Yeah. Whatever that, way. That's what we, yeah, whatever way. So that's what we'd like to see happen. But that's not what we do from a policy point of view and a program point of view. 
Right? We do exactly what you mentioned earlier. We move the victim. Mm-hmm. We don't touch him because we don't want to have programs that are targeting men. We don't want to have the supports for them. So we're going to move the victims around, but then this cycle continues and continues. Where, where else have if, we heard if, about that happening in a specific institution? Where they just <laughs> move them to a new pair. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> it was out loud. Um, so if, if, you know, men are the problem in this situation, well, why wouldn't you target the men with programs and try and stop yeah. it from happening? That's the logical approach for this thing. Right. But that's not what yeah. we're doing. Bill, sir, you are a good man. I hope we can work with you in the future because, sorry, I'm getting emotional because what what you're saying is really, really important and what you're doing is really important because if we don't do something, the problem is not going to go away and it will get worse and more men will be thrown away and we're going to lose a whole generation of men. And like you say, men, I'm, I'm 56 in three weeks, right? And... I know guys my age who are suddenly being able to open up to me because I'm open about it. I talk about it. And guys who've come to me and said, you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I'm like, yeah, you have depression. You need to go talk to your doctor. I'm not a counselor. I'm not qualified to, you know, but I can see that you have something I would think is depression. So I always tell people, really you important. don't, you don't need to be the face of it. Like no. I'm, I come to terms. I did all the research I could do because I wanted to understand what the heck was happening. And mm-hmm. then I wanted to help other guys that were going through it. So you don't have to come out and have your face on a billboard. You don't have to do a podcast. What you need to do is get help. Yeah. It's confidential. You can go in through the back door of a place and you can come out through the back door and yeah. nobody needs to know unless you're telling them, but you need to get the help. Right. If you're not comfortable sharing that, that's fine. That's fine. I'm that's out doing this work. You guys are out, you know, talking about this. You don't need to be the guy talking about it. You need to be the guy that gets help for you and your family. That's the responsibility that you have. Yeah, and that's the message that we need to get out to a lot of a lot of guys. Yep, I concur. Um, so on my website or on the Lonely Man website, I should say, my website is I actually changed in the fall of last year to focus uh, on men. So it's actually counseling for men now, trying to bring men into into counseling. Hey, this is a, a spot for you to go. But on the LonelyMan.ca website, you'll see I I put up there. It's called Thirty Days of Depression. Yes. And so I had uh, a few years ago. I had a lot of guys, and I guess I was. Oh, I guess late forties, a lot of guys that were reaching out to me privately through Facebook because they're going through issues and had a lot of questions about depression. I, of course I was putting, you know, talking about men's mental health, but I realized I'd never actually talked about myself. Mm-hmm. I, I assume people knew I'd gone through depression because I was so, you know, such a big advocate for it. But I said, so for November this year, instead of raising money, I'm going to talk about myself. I'm going to throw in some of my experiences and I'm going to put some of the psychology with it and why this was happening. You know, like one of the things my wife and I did when I, I went through the depression and again, I, I wasn't listening to her. You don't no. listen to the people closest to you. You don't, you don't. So we did a lot, you know, I did a lot of damage and, and like I say, God love her. She stuck with me. I'm not, I'm not a peach at the best of times, <laughs> 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 but we actually went to a, a psychologist that the psychologist could explain men's mental health and what was going on. So it wasn't coming from me. It was coming from a trained professional. So there's different ways to approach this as mm-hmm. well. Once you become aware and decide I'm going to do something about it, your life can return. You can be happy. You can be healthy. You can move forward and you can have the life that you want, but it's really in your hands to get the help once you do become aware of it. And so for us in, in Newfoundland, I want to have a campaign. I want to change that conversation. I want to have billboards up. I want men to, to get this information wherever they can. Um, I was part of a bro matters national research project back around 2016 2017 i don't know if you ever heard of john john lee wang dr john lee mm-hmm. wang um i come across something that he did and it was called the depression indicator and so you answer these questions based on the algorithm that it gives you it actually gives you the um likelihood of you developing depression in a time frame based on how you answer these questions wow wow yeah i'll, I'll dig out the link and i can i can send it to you appreciate that um, thank you but i was like Coming out of graduate school, like, oh my God, look at this thing. This mm-hmm. is absolutely phenomenal. And so I called him and said, or I sent him an email and said, well, would you be open to talking about this? I'd love to understand more. And uh, so he gave me 15 minutes, you know, three weeks down the road sort of thing. And we got on the phone and started talking. And we talked for an hour and a half. So he was, he called, I guess about two weeks later, he sent me an email and said, I'm, I got this new project that just got funded from November. It's called Bro Matters. And would you be on the advisory committee for it? I was the only guy from the East Coast that was on this advisory committee. And the idea with the project was it was an e-mental health program. They're trying to see how do men consume information? 
how can we mm-hmm. reach these guys? So the idea is, is like, you know, men are, they're not going to walk around with, you know, a, a Jeffrey counseling and wellness hat on, no. you know, they're not going to walk around with their, with their thought journal. You know, that's <laughs> not going to happen. But what they will do is take their phone. And if you see a billboard today that resonates with them when mm-hmm. they're in bed tonight and they're flicking through their phone, they might surf to that. Yeah. And get yeah. that information. Right. And again, mm-hmm. it's, you know, we're, we've got a lot of shame and guilt that goes along with this, but if we can get the information to the men to get to read it and consume it without making it in, imposed upon them and other people knowing about it, they're much more likely to, to seek it out and it's going to land with them. Like I said, we might not know we're reaching these guys. Well, but I, I believe over time that some of these statistics of, of suicide and domestic violence will start to come down and then we'll know we've reached a lot of these guys. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the things that uh, made me fight against going to get help was the thing that can't happen to me can't happen to me no no that ha- that's for somebody else no no and then you just keep silent about it and and that's what i think the vast majority of men do it's not me oh god no no i don't have that I, that would never happen to me look at me i'm fit i'm you know. that's what you went through that's what so many men go through and then when you do realize okay there is something wrong with me the last thing you want to do is talk to anybody about it and that's that's exactly. she's trying to eat my food. <laughs> that's why she keeps getting up on me. That's the last thing you want to do, though, is is you know come to the realization that, and and admit to yourself that there's something wrong, because you don't you think you're weak, you think you're failing, you think society will look down upon you because that's what society has taught us to think. Well, I'm going to throw something else, a different angle at you <clears throat> that I've noticed from putting this event together. So I always talk about a double stigma. Mm-hmm. So for men, you know, mental health issues are, are hard anyway for everybody. But for men, it's the problem that I can't handle my own business. Yep. Mm. You know, I've been brought up to be competitive and, and dominant. You know, the guys next to me, even though, you know, we're friends, I can't open up to them because I'm competitive with those guys. Yeah. By the time you get to be, you know, say 50 odd, you don't have a lot of uh, social capital around you don't have those guys to talk to because you've been competitive with them all your life and you don't go in and talk to the guy and, that you're competitive with and say i don't feel very strong today i don't feel very good well the competitor would love to hear that yeah so you, mm-hmm. you just don't mm-hmm. talk about it so we have the stigma of being a guy and admitting you don't have a problem then you got a double stigma of it's a mental health issue which is you know huge to admit for anybody mm-hmm. oh, but yes. now i'm finding that there's actually a third stigma and the third stigma that I found from putting this event together is that we've, we've created a zero sum game. So if mm. you support men, that means you don't yes. support any of these other groups. Right. And that's, that's a real stigma that's out there. Not for everybody. Again, I use broad strokes here, mm-hmm. yep, but yep. I found like I've got people that's that the vibe out there. supported me for everything I've ever done. Mm-hmm. And with this, even though I could, I could be texting them and say, well, can you check your email about the event? I sent you a silent auction request or an invite to get a table or whatever. And then radio silence. And then we might pick up the conversation in a week, like like I never mentioned the event. So we've got we've got a situation where you know we've got to bridge a gap here now between you know men's mental health and it being socially acceptable to support men. Yeah, indeed. That's and huge. that's that's a huge problem. So like I know here in Newfoundland, you know I've got a whole portion of people that have never acknowledged lonely man. They don't smack it but they don't talk about it either. They don't promote it. Now, some of these folks, when I sit down with them and they understand where this came from, what we're trying to do, you know, I always say that, you know, with men's mental health, A, we all know a guy mm-hmm. and B, it's a, it's a we thing, not a he thing. Right? Yeah, need- that's what you, on your website. I noticed that right away. And it's like, you are so correct, sir. It we is a we everybody thing. at the table, everybody yeah. you come yeah. to the table if we're going to fix this and it affects absolutely everybody. If it's the hockey rinks, if it's, you know, the, the playground, if it's at work, if it's at home, men, men's mental health is affecting us everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right? And we're not even necessarily realizing it. So we all have some skin in the game when it comes to this. And, I, you know, I, for my, my money, I think that's something that we need to do. We need to redefine what it means to be a man. Um, you know, we don't need to go to the go back to the Andrew Tate days. We also don't need to, you know, become you know, a different version of women. There's a middle mm-hmm. ground here. Yeah. And that's just right. moving men slightly over here and replacing those destructive behaviors with some more healthier behaviors. Yep. I concur. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, how are we doing for time? 
I got to roll, sir. I do have to get running. Apologies. Uh, but I still have to. I have two days of work left today and tomorrow. <laughs> Monday, I might have all the time in the world. I don't even know what's happening yet. So, But I do have to go in and, and earn a couple of bucks so I can keep a roof over this doggy's head. <laughs> um, so um, um, as, uh, as we go out and end the show, uh, we will play the song. Uh, but before we do that, um, thank you so very much. Oh, goodness. Uh, yes. Sir for coming uh, on the show, being a guest uh, this morning. Um, uh, as we tell uh, all our guests uh, with regard uh, to our initiative, um, you have a home here. So if there's something else th that crosses your mind, something else you need to say, something that happens in the news, and uh, you have some thoughts about it and you want to bring it up, uh, please, please, please do contact us. Um, this is not just a... Um, a flavor of the month thing that we're doing it's uh, no. it's part of our it's it's part of our Mandate. our culture here that we're trying to build on the show so um well, I, I anytime that. you just send me a message i've got something we'll we'll make a time yeah fantastic we'll that's wonderful listen guys thanks for having me on i really enjoyed the conversation that's I'm excited for tonight it's going to be a a good night in newfoundland and labrador I'll, I'll send you some pictures when we when we get them back and please do please do and uh, and we'll have a uh, dr whitley uh next friday on the 20th on our show so i'll Excellent. be able to let us know how it went <laughs> you went out for some uh, fish and chips with us last night so yeah he's a delight, oh, lovely. delightful individual yeah he's got lots lots to talk about good oh times. good absolutely good all right, sir, you take care. We have to roll on out. I'm going to so end much. the show with your video. So thanks again, sir. We'll talk thanks, to you. Thanks, guys. Oh, by take the care. way, the kids have loved you. If you go back oh, and yes. read the comments, so we need more, Bill. Oh, uh, one question before you go. Someone wanted to know what your thesis was. I did the uh, course route. The what? We had, we had a choice of doing a thesis or you could do more courses. Oh, okay. I oh, the okay. Course okay. The course the thesis route. is going to take me much longer. Yeah, and yeah. to do my master's, I actually left my job because I wanted to do it all at one time instead of picking a course here and there. And so I actually did a security job while I was doing my master's at Republic of Doral. I don't know if you saw the show or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I used to Love sit up in show. the studio nighttime, and that's where I did all my coursework because I'd be in with the, the set and all that stuff. Nothing happened. And I just got to do my, got paid to do my courses. Excellent. So I did the course route and so yeah so we've got like the the world needs more bill thanks bill with a heart thank you bill this was very informative and you're doing awesome work you're awesome bill thank you thank you for coming bill thank you bill and everyone have fun tonight everyone's uh sending all you all the good thanks so love. much guys i pre i appreciate it and all you guys out there you guys take care take all care right, of yourselves. You too. take care all right bye. Hey, boys. bye now okay mr grizzly we have some tunes we have some tunes. This is and the YouTube. Lonely man. We have the rights. We yeah, got we permission. Right we do. asked. We permission. <laughs> All right. So this is the lonely it. man. The official video. I'm just gonna go. We're gonna go full screen on this one. And actually, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna take ourselves right out of the picture. Let's right. just watch the video. All right. He's got a family, kids and a wife Oh, he's got a good job, he's living the life But he's got a secret, and he's got a plan Nobody knows yet, but he's the lonely man When he was young Hard as a rock He was all action No time for talk He worked hard, he played hard Hell, he had to win And he was told to be tough Again and again And now the lonely man Doesn't tell you how he's feeling Lonely man, he just hides his pain The lonely man, inside he's reeling He pretends the sunshine in the rain These days when he's at home, well he's always mad even when he is there, his kids miss dad. Cause he needs to talk now, 
But who would he talk to? He loves her so much But that's something he can't do He spends his nights Alone in a bar Or spinning old tunes Sitting in his car Sometimes when he's in bed And he'll start to yawn She's laying next to him wondering where's he really gone Because the lonely man doesn't tell you how he's feeling The lonely man, he just hides his pain The lonely man, inside he's Pretends it's sunshine and the rain He's gotten older But he's not the same He's the latest player In this tired game he once was a warrior, but he's feeling dumb Inside his mind, his world weighs a ton And he's full of guilt now, oh he's full of shame And he hears a silence when no one calls his name he feels real numb, but his heart is sore Pretty soon that lonely man won't be lonely anymore Because the lonely man doesn't tell you how he's feeling The lonely man, he just hides his pain Just found some sunshine in his brain